Okay, good. So welcome everybody to our uh, second week of the spring seminar series in the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems here at UMBC. And uh, we are very happy to uh, feature our speaker today, Megan, Dr. Megan Avolio of, of Johns Hopkins University. Um, before I go ahead and introduce Megan, I just want to point out, I'm going to share a screen for, a, I don't know if I can share a screen. Um, okay, I can't share it. I want to remind you that our, our seminar series continues with multiple other presentations. Coming up next week, and actually is um, Dr. Don Beeler from our department, who is actually presenting at the Dresher Center for the Humanities, Humanities Forum next Tuesday, the 16th from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Her topic will be embodying empire through captivity, geographies of caged animals, human domination and struggle in New York Central Park. And that will be followed um, on Wednesday, February 24th uh, um, here uh, on our own uh, WebEx with Dr. Timothy Thomas, research director of the Urban Displacement Project at Berkeley, uh, who will be talking about the Baltimore eviction study and the urban displacement in US cities. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, Macon and then um, she'll take over. And uh, one thing I would uh, like to mention is that if you have questions, which I hope you will, um, we will ask you to post something in the chat to indicate that. And then um, we'll ask you to unmute and ask your question live. Um, uh, we'll just sort of go through them in order. And then uh, if there are folks who are interested in sticking around for a little bit to chat after uh, we reach the end of the seminar at one, uh, Dr. Volio is available until about 1.30. So if people are interested in doing that, uh, we'll just keep the meeting open and you can stay uh, and maybe go get, get your lunch and sit, sit and talk with us for a bit. So without any further ado, uh, Dr. Megan Avolio is currently assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Johns Hopkins University. She was named the Ecological Society of America Early Career Fellow in 2020. After receiving her BA in biology from Barnard College in 2002, Dr. Avolio proceeded to Fordham University for her master's in biology in 2006. Uh, she was awarded a Fulbright to Germany to continue uh, the research she started her master's and in 2012, she received her PhD from Yale University, where she uh, wrote a dissertation exploring the adaptability of the dominant tall grass species, Andropogon gerardii, to increase precipitation variability. After her PhD, she was a research assistant professor at the University of Utah, where she investigated plant community assembly and cultivated urban ecosystems. She then completed a postdoc at CSYNC, where she was developing community change metrics for species rank abundance curves and synthesizing data from more than 100 global change experiments from around the world. I think we're gonna hear about some of that work today. Throughout her career, she's taken an interdisciplinary approach to work across scales, bridging the gap between gene expression and ecosystem function. So without further ado, we're very happy to welcome Megan to uh, talk to us about her great work. Um, take it away, Megan. Great. Um, first, I want to say I'm so excited to virtually be with all of you in a room and to talk about my research today. Um, as Andy said, yes, I'm going to be talking about um, the data synthesis work I do that I started doing while a postdoc. And let's see here. I should say that all this work, like really, um, Kim Kamatsu is a co author of this talk. We co lead all these synthesis efforts. And um, she's been integral in all this research. So right in the beginning, I just wanna acknowledge her. So I think a lot about communities. I think a lot about plant communities. This is a bird's eye view of a couple. Um, plants, as we all know, form the basis of food for all of our trophic levels um, and are really important in addition to really beautiful. And we know from succession and from ecology that plant communities change over time. Um, as they change, the, so does the ecosystem functions is that, that they perform, and then the ultimate, ultra resulting ecosystem services that they provide. And so I'm really interested in, in understanding this change, and they change naturally through time through successional processes, but they also change in response to global change, and especially in response to experimental treatments that ecologists um, subject them to. And that's what I'm interested in today, and I'll be spending most of my time talking about. 
So why focus on global change? I love this um, graph of my former PhD advisor just shows that everything is generally changing. So there's as the population of humans have increased through time shown in the blue line, so has the amount of um, nitrogen and nitrogen will directly affect plant growth. So has the amount of carbon dioxide in the air as well as temperature and all these things can directly feed back and affect um, plant growth and plant communities. So I wanna to start today's talk with uh, an example of an experiment I work out at Conza Prairie and then take from this one example, scale up to global scales. So we're gonna start um, in the phosphorus experiment. It's a long-term nitrogen and phosphorus addition experiment at Kanza Prairie. Where is Kanza? Kanza is in Northeastern Kansas. Um, it is tall grass prairie. You can see that when you mostly look across the landscape, it's green. There's a lot, a lot of grass here. Um, so grass makes up the majority of the production and how much biomass is being produced, but forbs make up the majority of the plant diversity in the system. And I very biasly think it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. So this experiment adds nitrogen and phosphorus. There's two nitrogen treatments, either zero or 10 grams, and four phosphorus treatments, zero, 2.55, or 10 grams of phosphorus. It's fully factorial, it's a cross experiment. It started in 2002, and um, the treatment started in 2003, and we have every year of data except for last year due to COVID. And so, as I said, these, you know, we looked at that picture of the grassland, it's really dominated by grasses. This is a rank abundance curve. Most of the cover are C4 grasses. The next most common plant functional uh, type is C3 grasses, followed by different types of forward species. And there's no annual grasses in this system naturally, and um, very few annual forb species. So this is what we observe in ambient conditions in this experimental site. And so here is, um, I'm going to show a bunch of graphs like this with year on the x-axis going up to 2012 and the cover of the different plant functional types. So you'll see here in the control plots, no nitrogen, P N0, no phosphorus, P0. The cover of the C4 grasses is held steady around between 70 and 80 percent throughout the entire course of this experiment. C3 grasses are come next, and then these forbs are part of the community, but make up much lower cover, much lower abundance. And when we add phosphorus alone, we don't really see a shift in the community, right? These C3, these C4 grasses are maintaining their dominance. When we add nitrogen alone, we start to see changes in the community. So the C4 grasses lose their dominance, the forbs become more abundant, and um, the C3 grasses also become more abundant. But things get really interesting when we add nitrogen and phosphorus together. What we see is that not only do the C4 grasses lose their dominant, annual grasses become an important part of the system and the different um, and perennial non-nitrogen fixing forbs even overtake C4 grasses in their dominance. So we're seeing a huge shift in the community. And we observed this shift in about 2006, where after four years of nutrient additions, we saw this wholesale turnover in the overall plant community. And so, all right, we saw this change in the plant community. You know, I think that's enough to care, but a lot of people want to have a link to function. How has function changed? So now I'm going to just look at overall net primary production. So this is the zero line. So this is the uh, treated plots relative to the control plots with just without nitrogen, so phosphorus alone. And you can see with phosphorus alone, there's not big deviations from how much um, production there was in the control plots. Everything hovers right around zero. However, when we add nitrogen with the phosphorus, um, we see that there are really big effects. And so I wanna walk you through this. First, we see in the first three years of the experiment, you add nitrogen and phosphorus, you have an increase in production. Great, that makes total sense. We know that these grasslands are nitrogen limited. We should see a production response and we do. But then in the next three years, we don't see any production response. We don't see any effect of adding nitrogen to these plots. And this occurs right after there starts to be reordering within the community. And then at the end of this period, what we see is that in um, burn years, which are shown in gray, we have really great increases in production. And in non-burn years, we don't really have that effect. And so what it looks like is in these burn years, when there's no light limitations and there's no nutrient limitations, these four species can really, really pack on lots of production. And so this is creating a more variable ecosystem where there's boom and bust years in terms of production, and it's being driven by fire and climate. And so we see big um, consequences for ecosystem function of the system. And this is what it looked like. Um, this is in 2008. This is all Canisa canadensis. 
Um, you can see the heterogeneous landscape and these patches where you have this really tall floor was where we had nitrogen and phosphorus. And this is a little, you know, who's canonized canadensis? Well, now it's actually original canadensis. It's like a city slicker. It's found in all cities. It's, it's here as well. And so that's what's happening overall in the plant community. And we want to then understand how, um, well, how is overall composition changing? So we saw these changes in the functional group, but what about the composition of all the plant species there? And so this is an NMDS. I want to take a moment to orient you to this. Right now, we're just looking at the control plots in NMDS space. And these points that are close together are more similar to one another in terms of community composition. So these two points on top of each other probably have fairly identical community composition. And so when we add phosphorus alone, they all fall right on top of the control plot. Phosphorus, as I've shown earlier, isn't changing much. And here, this is further proof that phosphorus alone is not having a big impact on the plant community composition. When we add nitrogen, we see a shift in the community composition, but the plots are fairly close to one another. And when we add nitrogen and phosphorus together, we see this big spread across, um, across the plot. And what this means is that here in plots that have high, high nitrogen and high phosphorus, 10 grams of each, they really are very far apart from one another. And what this means is that they're probably dominated by different species. And this is in fact the case. Some are dominated by annual grass, some by a perennial um, forb. This is another perennial forb, and this is by a seaboard grass. So what we're seeing is this greater heterogeneity across the landscape. We're seeing really divergent community responses in response to having nitrogen and phosphorus added. And this was really exciting. Um, this was, I was learning this. I wrote this paper at the end of my PhD. And Kim was a fellow grad student in the lab with me. And we were curious, like, okay, how often does this happen? You know, how often do you observe replicates really diverging from one another in response to treatments? And does this matter on how many um, resources are being manipulated? We only saw this really divergent effect when we add nitrogen and phosphorus together, not nitrogen or phosphorus alone. So this got us, as I said, to this question. How common can we study this and what are the best ways to study this? So Kim and I um, applied for an LTR synthesis working group and we were funded and we, we formed the community responses to resource experiments. This was back in 2012. Um, only Greg was a professor at that time. The rest of us were postdocs or graduate students and now we all have positions we like. So to the grad students in your department, there is hope, there is light at the end of this tunnel. Um, and then we got funded for a second working group from the LTR synthesis group that was at NCs, where we took these ideas further. And this was a bigger working group, um, but it was still led by Kim myself, Kim and myself, and now Kevin was on it at, for that round. And so together, now I'm gonna just take us through what this database is and what have we learned by synthesizing across all different global changes. So the first thing we did when we got back together, and this was back in 2013, we were thinking about, we were really interested in these multivariate patterns that we observed in the peat plots experiment, and we wanted to conceptualize um, different ways to study community changes. And so we said, okay, we can look at overall the mean, where, is the, where do the centroids fall in this multivariate space? And then the variance, what's the dispersion around the centroid in this multivariate space? So again, this is multivariate community space. It's like that NMDS I showed you. Points that are closer together have more similar communities. And we're thinking about this in an experimental framework. So we have control replicates and triangles and treated replicates and circles. And so if you have no change in the mean and no change in variance, there's no change in the community. And that's what we observed with the phosphorus additions, right? But you can have a change in the mean, but no change in variation. And that's what we observed with the nitrogen addition treatments. But we can also, we have all combinations of this. So we can have no change in mean, but an increase or a decrease in variance and a change in mean or an, or an increase or decrease in variance. And again, this is this one is what we observed with the nitrogen and phosphorus improvements. And so we conceptualize these are the ways communities can change. Um, this takes into account aspects of beta diversity. There's um, dispersion beta diversity and also turnover beta diversity. Um, yeah, here we go. And so this is really looking at differences. So we think that mean is looking at overall differences in community composition and variance is looking at overall differences in heterogeneity among replicants. And so then we went out to the literature and we found examples of all these different ways that communities can change in response to global change drivers from salt marshes um, all the way to invasive ant communities in Australia. And so here's just an example of all the different ways that we can observe change. So here, right, there's 
no change in mean, no change in variance, and here's no change in, um, here's a change in mean and a change in variance. But if you're like me and you're looking at these plots now, it's like, okay, cool, I can detect these patterns. I see that the community composition is changing in both mean and variance. But what about the community has changed? Like, why is this point here and why is that point there? What about these communities are different? There's something about, I think multivariate methods are really powerful ways to synthesize the whole community, but they're very abstract. And as a person who loves plants and likes thinking about plant species, I want to know a little bit more about what's happening in the community. So this got us thinking about the five fundamental ways that community composition can change and how rank abundance curves can be used to study those changes. So here's a rank abundance curve I showed earlier with plant functional types. The species with rank one in the community is the most abundant. The species less, like, ranked last in the community is the least abundant. And here's a community at time zero. So before any treatment, we could, if we're thinking in an experimental context. So we can have a change in evenness. So here the line has become flatter. The slope has changed. And a steep slope means it's a very uneven community. A few species dominate and the rest are rare. A really flat slope means that it's a fairly even community. Every species has fairly similar abundances within the community. We can have a reordering of species. Um, here are the, the um, most dominant became rare and vice versa. We can have a loss of species. We can have a gain of species. And we can also have a change in species richness where here there's four species and here there's only three and here there's five. So these are just the five fundamental ways that community composition can change over time. And we think they're gonna give insights into how multivariate patterns, in, into multivariate patterns of community changes. And there's two ways to study community responses in an experimental framework through time. So first is you can track how much a single replicate changes through time, right? So here we have a control plot and from time one to time three, it changed in a certain way. And we can do the same thing for a treatment plot. We can say, okay, how much did treatment plot replicate two change over time? And then we can compare the rates of change among these two replicates. And we can say, maybe the control plot didn't change very much and the treatment plot changed a lot. We can also compare differences between plots at a single point in time. So we can say, okay, at time one, how different were the control and treated plots versus at time three? And so change is a comparison across time and difference is a comparison across space. And we think this is, you know, this is obviously straightforward, but we think it's a detail on a level that maybe is sometimes neglected when people are really analyzing long-term experimental data sets, which are, uh, you know, a hallmark of many LTR sites. And so here we have, we're back to the multivariate methods. And we said, you know, multivariate methods, there's lots of different ways to visualize them, but there's not a lot of ways to really extract data and have meaningful measures to compare. And so we're thinking about the distance between centroids as overall compositional change. So if two centroids of two treated plots or of two treatments are very far apart, we're gonna say that those um, communities are very different from one another versus if they're close together. And then we can also look at dispersion change. So did the treatment overall affect dispersion? And so we have um, different measures to calculate this. And so um, part of my postdoc was to create an R package to operationalize this so everyone could analyze communities this way. And so we have metrics for studying change and metrics for studying difference, which are again, just different ways of analyzing um, data in experimental framework in a long-term experimental framework. And um, what we're really interested in is trying to understand how these rank abundance based curve metrics affect multivariate patterns of change, right? We wanna get more insight into when we see these different multivariate patterns, what about the community is different? And so in um, what we did is we took a long-term data set of observational data only. And we said, how, is the ch how are these communities changing through time? And, and then looked at how these different metrics explain how they change through time. So I'm showing you a really busy slide here. So I'm gonna take a second to orient everyone to this. Um, this is a plot comparing of how absolute richness change is related to absolute evenness change. So on the bottom quadrat, we see the overall correlation between them. There's no strong relationship. Um, and in the top, I have the R value of that correlation. So 0.9 and an asterisk denotes whether or not it's significant. You'll note that most things here are significant. It's because there's so much data. And the long-term data set I use has all different types of um, organisms. So it's not limited to plants. It's a different levels in the trophic chain. 
And so this is just broad scale patterns that can be observed in biological communities. And um, what is most interesting to me is looking at composition change. This is what I said we wanted to try and understand and explain when we, you know, how is composition different? And what we find is that composition change is most strongly correlated to changes in ranks or reordering within an extant community. So when we see big different, big compositional differences in communities, it doesn't necessarily mean, mean that there's been large gains or losses of species. It could just be that the same plants or the same species in a community are reordering. So maybe rare species are becoming dominant and vice versa. And when I used this, did this exact same now analysis on a simulated data set. So a data set where I simulated different patterns of change within a community. Um, I found that species gains and losses were equally correlated with composition change than rank change. So it really does suggest that within realistic biological communities, changes in ranks are a more important um, uh, process than maybe appreciated. And so now I want to go back to that peapots example and I want to apply these different measures of rank changes and say, okay, we saw these big changes in the community. What about the community was changing? And so now I'm just focusing on the control treatment, the nitrogen treatment, and the high nitrogen and phosphorus treatment. And we can see the overall richness. It wasn't richness that was driving these differences. It wasn't evenness. It wasn't species gains and it wasn't species losses. There are no significant differences among those of the rates of change through time um, of treated versus control plots. And what we do see is that, that we had greater reordering with the plots that had high nitrogen and phosphorus compared to control plots and compared to nitrogen only plots. So what we find in this example is that we saw these big changes in the community composition and that was those changes were driven by reordering within the extant community. It wasn't driven by turnover of species. And now I'm gonna just make a quick plug for this R package because it was so much work and I do think it's useful. Um, none of the measures are redundant with one another. Um, they're all independent of the static richness and evenness of a community. So you could use these in a salt marsh as well as using them in a tall grass prairie that had very different um, base levels of community richness. The measures of change are really good at detecting temporal heterogeneity, so change over time. And the measures of difference are really good at detecting spatial heterogeneity. Multivariate composition is best explained by reordering. And I think, you know, reordering is understudied in ecology as a process. There's a lot more focus on turnover of species, and I think we need to look more at it. Um, and ultimately, our big theory, that we're, what we're pushing is that we think rank abundance curves when using them to track the five ways community change alongside multivariate measures will give really detailed insight into community responses and experimental frameworks. Okay, so plug over now um, back to this. So, all right, we have now we have hypotheses about how communities are changing. We have developed methods to study these hypotheses. What we need is a big data set to analyze. And so we went out and we created the core data set which is 106 global change experiments from 54 locations around the world. This is where they're found. Um, we did a real concerted effort to try and get more data sets in, um, in Africa and South America. And there's just not a lot that meet our criteria. They have to have be at least three years. They have to have at least five replicates. And that's because we wanted to really get a um, dispersion around a centroid. And we, if there's just three replicates, you're not gonna be able to really detect that. It has to be in herbaceous community. And it has to be a direct, they has to include a direct resource manipulation. So we have a whole range of different experiments in this data set. And so I'm gonna just give us some examples. Here are two experiments that manipulate the precipitation of timing. Um, the ramps right here in Kansas, this is where I did my whole dissertation. So I spent countless hours in those plots. Um, we have experiments that manipulate, that increase carbon dioxide as well as add nitrogen. Experiments that um, cross precipitation as well as temperature that cross carbon dioxide and temperature, add nitrogen and phosphorus, um, look at nitrogen and phosphorus, fire and grazing. And so now you can see that we have non-resource treatments as well as resource treatments. As long as the experiment manipulated a resource, it could be included. We have experiments that um, manipulate precipitation, nitrogen and temperature, as well as an experiment that does everything. This is the a Jasper Bridge experiment, carbon dioxide, preset nitrogen and temperature. And what I really like is, you know, in this example of Colorado versus New Mexico, they have the exact same treatments, which is an extremely different ecosystem types, and they're done in different ways. They're done in ways that are best suited for that, that location. So we have, as I said, around 107 experiments. 
they range from being three years to 27 years, between one resource to four resources being manipulated, between just having one manipulation to up to six, and they are from arid to music sites, uh, cold to fairly warm, low productive to high productive sites, and species poor to very species rich sites. So they really do span a gamut of different ecosystem conditions, of herbaceous ecosystem conditions, I should say, around the world. And so now we're gonna dive into some data synthesis here. So first we just wanna ask overall, how are communities being impacted by global change treatments? And so the first question is, over time, what's the difference between control and treated plots? And we're just focusing on two really commonly used measures. Here we're looking at species richness as well as community composition. Um, does the number of global change drivers and manipulated affect richness and composition? And do different global change driver treatments affect this? So like is adding carbon dioxide different than adding nitrogen? Does it have different community effects? So we input relative species abundance data. We looked at differences in richness and composition. And again, we're just taking it for a single year, how are control and treatment plots different from one another. For this analysis, we use the full core data set, which is a total of 438 control to treatment comparisons. And then we used a Bayesian uh, method to do the analyses where we looked at, you know, the responsive richness and community difference. And we looked at, um, to explain this, we looked at the type, number, and magnitude of global change factors, site level production, and site level gamma richness. And generally, the ecosystem variables, like how much production was there and how many species, did not affect any of the um, patterns we observed for change. So I'm not going to discuss that. So overall for richness, we find um, that there's no systemic change in plant species richness over time in response to all these different treatments. 78% 78, 78 of studies see no change in richness through time. So the large majority are just not changing a species richness. In contrast, we see that overall through time, communities are becoming more dissimilar from controls in terms of multivariate community difference. And we find that these effects are much stronger in the long term than the short term. And we also observe a whole lot of different trends. We observe parabolic trends. So overall, what we find here is that richness is fairly insensitive. Community composition is a better metric. And that the longer term the experiment is, the greater the community changes are going to be. We next, we looked into, okay, does the type of global change driver treatment matter? And what we find is generally no, in terms of here's richness and here's um, composition. The type of global change driver that you manipulate, you see about the same amount of change. But what we do find is that adding more resources result in greater differences. So again, here's richness and here's composition. If you add three resources together, you have bigger changes in richness. And if you had three or more, and same for um, community composition. If you add two or three or three or more resources in combination, you're going to have greater changes in community composition. So it's maybe not type of global change driver, it's just number of global change drivers that plots are being exposed to. Oh, and I highlighted that. And so, okay, over time, what's the difference? Are these treatments having an effect? What we're finding is that it's varied. Richness is systemically not changing while community compositions is becoming more different from the controls. Um, we find that yes, the number of global change drivers manipulated does matter that when you manipulate more global change drivers, we're seeing greater changes in community composition and greater changes in richness. And we do not see any difference between global change, global change driver types uh, and their effect on overall changes in community. And so and now I've showed you richness, and I've showed you composition, and I've hopefully what your appetite to saying, how about rack based measures right now? How do they are? How are they responding to these different global change drivers? And so that's what we did next. We're asking, okay, exactly how are the communities changing in response to global change drivers? So the first question is, are rack based measures of change affected by global change drivers? And does this differ by manipulation type or global change treatment? Next, we ask, is there a general progression to community change? And so it's been hypothesized that. There is a progression to how communities change that first there's changes at the level of the individual where individuals can grow more or less in response to a treatment that might change something like evenness. That then we have reordering of species within a community and eventually we'll have species loss and species immigration. And so that there's this progression in change. And in this framework, as this progression of change occurs, we have greater um, ecosystem responses. And so we wanted to use this data set to ask is can we detect a progression to community change? And third, we asked, 
How do different ecosystem properties explain the, the changes that we observe? So again, I'm putting in all this raw plant data into this analysis. And here we're doing a change analysis. We're saying, over time, how do the control plots change? So this is comparing time one to time two, two to three. And over time, how do the treatment plots change? And so here you can see there was a big change in treatments in year two, and then lower changes through time. For this analysis, because we really want to look at changes through time, we limited to only data sets with five or more years of data. This resulted in a total of 219 control to treatment comparisons. And so what did we find? Um, we found that first off, 71% of the time, communities underwent some aspect of change. So this is, you know, any change. But what was changing in the community was pretty split among all these different explanations, all, all the five ways a community can change. Um, richness changes were less common than changes in evenness and rank, but there was no significant difference in the proportion of change. So communities are changing every which way. Oh, and I didn't orient, sorry. So this is, if it's um, darker blue, it's a significant change in the community and a lighter blue, it's not. And so this is from a, the number of communities that change a proportion from zero to one. So then we looked into the type of change. So now we're looking at um, what about if it was a non-resource being manipulated like herbivory or temperature or burning? Um, what if it's a single resource like nitrogen alone or carbon dioxide? multiple resources together or resources and non-resources together. And so far for any change, you see that there was more, communities changed more when there were multiple resources co-manipulated. Um, and then this is it for the different aspects. This is for evenness, ranks, gains, and losses. And typically what we found is that multiple resources together resulted in greater changes than single resources alone. And non-resources and non-resources in combination with resources dampen the effect. So the effect of adding a resource is going to be dampened when you cross it with a non-resource like herbivory. Then we looked at the differences among specific global change driver treatments. Um, and again, we found no statistical differences among the treatments. So doesn't matter if you're adding carbon dioxide, water, changing the variation of how plants or how the communities are seeing precipitation, temperature, adding nitrogen, phosphorus, or multiple nutrients, you're seeing the same amount of change pretty much across all these different treatments, across all these different um, ways to study community changes. So now I wanna look at, is there a consistent sequence of change? So I'm, I'm finding that yes, rank abundance curves are detecting lots of different ways that communities can change. Now, can we detect any order? And so this is, we looked at the number of communities that observed evenness changing first, and then what changed after evenness. So this experiment had evenness change alone, then evenness followed by ranks changes, then evenness followed by losses, followed by reordering. So we found that evenness uh, change occurred alone first in 23% of experiments, ranks changed first in 29% of experiments, gains of change to first in 23% of experiments, and losses in 24. So together, there's no, we can not detect any progression in the order of change. Losses can occur first as frequently as changes of evenness can. And so this suggests that it's gonna be, if we're gonna be less able to predict a progression of change, communities can change at any time in any way. And finally for this, I'm gonna look at um, ecosystem properties. And so here we looked at um, the production of a site, precipitation, temperature, the, spe the regional species richness or gamma richness, and site evenness. And we looked at how, the, how these um, environmental and ecosystem properties affect the ability to detect richness, evenness, rank, gains, or losses. What I just really want to highlight is that these are the R squares I find. They are all extremely low. These ecosystem and environmental properties are not explaining a lot of the variation we observe in the ability of a community to change in response to global change drivers. But we, we can explain most of the variation in species gains, and we find that's being predominantly driven by regional species richness. So experiments that take place in a species area have a greater, um, are seeing more species gains into treated plots, which makes sense, right? There's a greater ability for species rain to come into new plots. So to summarize this, we find that, um, yeah, rack-based measures are affected by global change drivers, Multiple resources and resources cause more changes than non-resources alone. Um, but again, global change driver type does not differ in its impact. 
We find that there is not an ordered progression to community change, which is contrary to what's been hypothesized out in the literature. And we find that um, ecosystem properties can explain variation in the magnitude. Oh, we find that ecosystem properties can't explain variation in the magnitude of um, these community changes. And so then lastly, I'm going to use the same data set, but I'm going to investigate how production is being impacted. So how is net primary production being impacted? For this, we're asking, um, do global change drivers affect the mean and temporal variability of production? So that's our first question. Second is, do abiotic and biotic characteristics affect global change drivers and temporal variability of ANPP? Um, Wait, first, I want to just give a little more context here. So first, we're just asking is temporal variability is really the stability of ANPP. And we want communities to be stable, right? We want to basically have, we want to be able to estimate the amount of production that's going to occur. That's going to give rise to lots of ecosystem services. We can think in the context of grazing. We don't want to have boob and bust years. We want to be able to have our cattle or bison get the same amount of forage every year. So we're really interested here in temporal variability of ANPP. And then we want to understand can we can temporal can observe differences in temporal variability of ANPP be affected by abiotic and biotic site characteristics? And then finally, we want to understand do global change drivers affect the sensitivity of ANPP to annual precipitation? And so you can think of a site as being very sensitive to ANPP if in a wet year it has huge amounts of production and in a dry year it has basically no production. That's going to be very variable and it's going to be dependent on precipitation. A site that is not sensitive, it doesn't, it's going to basically give you the same amount of production regardless of how much rain fell that year. And so this is what we're going to investigate. Um, so here we've looked, we put in plot level production data for all years of an experiment. And then for each treatment, we calculated overall across all years, what's the mean, what's the standard deviation of that mean, and then what's the coefficient of variation. And so the coefficient of variation is the standard deviation divided by the mean. And here we're looking at control treatment differences and we're away from any plot level analysis. We're not looking at plots. We're looking at the aggregate of all plots within a treatment. For this data set, we only use, um, for this analysis, we only use data sets with six or more years of ANPP data. So every data set does not have ANPP data, only 58% do. And so for this, there's a total of 95 control treatment comparisons. We want to really use longer data sets because we want to really investigate temporal variability. And we thought, you know, three years or less are not going to be enough to give insights in temporal variability. So first we find that um, most global change drivers surprisingly do not affect mean or variability of production. So this is all treatments and all treatments overall have no significant effect on the mean biomass of the, of the plots. But when they do have an effect, generally you see an increase and rarely do you see a decrease in biomass. And the reason we think there's so much are an increase, this is an artifact of the experiments we were able to put into this database. We don't have any six year drought experiments included. So you might expect that a drought would reduce biomass. Um, we find that multiple nutrients result in the most changes in production. Then we look at the coefficient of variation of ANPP. Is it changing in temporal? Is it changing temporally? And we find that overwhelmingly there's no effect. And when there is effect, sometimes it's an increase and sometimes it's a decrease. It's both all over. And so this is a vote tallying, tallying way. And we can also look at this at overall, what's the effect size? What's the magnitude of these different, um, of these treatment effects? And so here we're looking at production. And overall, these different treatments are increasing ANPP um, with multiple nutrients having the greatest increases on production but nitrogen, water, and interacting global change drivers. So this is um, any measure of multiple resources being co-manipulated, all having positive effects on how much production is being observed. But for the temporal variability, it's, there's no significant differences happening. And so this is because we think that there were both increases and decreases being observed in these studies. So globally, we don't see any change in temporal variability of ANP. Then we want to look at potentially what is, uh, how do different ecosystem properties affect this? And so we find that there's no effect of species richness on the difference in temporal variability. And so here I just want to orient you. So zero, if, if a point fell on the zero line, it means that the temporal variability of the control and the treated plots were the same. If it was, if it's negative, it means that the treated plots are less variable. And if it's positive, it means that the treated plots are more variable. But we do find an effect of evenness, precipitation, and temperature where plots that have low evenness, so are dominated by a few species, 
are less variable than control plots. Um, with precipitation, we find that wet sites are becoming more, I mean, dry sites are becoming more variable, but wet sites are becoming less variable. And uh, cold sites are becoming more variable and hot sites are becoming less variable. And we're able to explain a significant variation like 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.5 here, 497, um, in variation in the data. So these ecosystem properties are important in determining responsiveness of AMPP to global change drivers. And finally, we looked at the sensitivity. Um, we're finding that overall globally, these different treatments are making the um, plots or are making the communities more sensitive to precipitation, which means that they are responding more strongly to annual precipitation. And this is also true for multiple nutrients alone, but it's not true for nitrogen, water, or interacting nutrient or interacting treatments alone. And water decreases, which makes total sense. If you're giving plots water every single year, they're going to be, you would assume that they'd be less affected by how much rain is falling because they're being supplemented through irrigation. Um, but again, it's not significant. So how is production being in, impacted by global change drivers? We find that um, global change drivers are having varied effect on mean and temporal very on mean and temporal variability of MPP, where they're increasing mean and MPP, but they're having no effect on temporal variability. Um, we're finding that temporal variability is affected by the evenness, the precipitation and the temperature of a site, but not richness. And that yes, the global change drivers are making the experiment, the ecosystems more sensitive to annual precipitation. And so globally across all the information I have thrown in front of you, what, what can we take home by doing this synthesis of all the different experiments? Well, first we found that richness is not a great way to measure community changes. And that kind of makes sense. You can have a community of five species and then impose a treatment and have another community of five species, but these five species can be entirely different, but we're still going to detect an, uh, a richness of five. We find that our um, rank abundance curves can be used to study the five ways that community composition changes and that they're pretty informative for understanding multivariate patterns of change. We find that global change driver treatments, um, many of them have no change, no community effects or ecosystem effects. So for the overall community, we found 30% of the time there was no change. We found the majority of the time there was no treatment effect on production. And this is kind of surprising because most ecologists don't go out to do an experiment in the field and say like, oh, I'm doing this experiment because I think there's gonna be no effect, right? People generally do a treatment because they think there's gonna be effect, especially with global change experiments. A common critique is that the amount of resources that are being manipulated are just not even realistic. People throw down extremely high levels of nitrogen. And so here though, although we still find that a lot of the time we don't detect a treatment response. And that I think suggests a resistance of communities and ecosystems to global change drivers that's perhaps underappreciated. When you look at all these studies alone, it really looks like there's such great impacts. But when you synthesize, a big, a big thing we're learning here is that a lot of time the communities are just resistant to what's being thrown at them. Um, we find that when they do actually respond to the global change drivers, the specific treatment, like is it carbon, is it nitrogen, is it phosphorus, really doesn't matter very much. When instead what matters a lot more is how many things are being simultaneously manipulated. And so we find that when things are being simultaneously manipulated, like multiple resources, so adding carbon dioxide, adding nitrogen, and changing precipitation, we observe the greatest community responses and the greatest community effects. And I think this is a really important point, because as we all know, global change does not occur in a vacuum, right? Carbon dioxide is increasing everywhere, which is happening at the same time that the world is being over-fertilized, having the same time that precipitation and temperature is changing. And so what really this means is that what we're learning from these single factor experiments might underestimate how much things are going to change um, in response to global change. Um, and finally, we found that um, ecosystem and environmental problems are really poor predictors for community responses, how communities are changing, but they were good predictors for overall production responses. And I don't really, I haven't had time to digest like really what that means on a biological level, but I think it's something that we want to spend more time thinking about. And so finally, what are we doing now? We are now funded through um, SDIV to uh, run a synthesis group looking at how um, these communities are changing in terms of phylogenetic dispersion as well as functional traits. So we're doing a huge effort. I spent a lot of my time now Googling plants and determining their traits. Um, and we're gonna look at overall how are the traits of the communities changing with the goal of them being able to link community changes through traits to changes in ecosystem production. 
And so with that, I want to thank you for your time and listening. I want to thank everyone that contributed data to us. Um, if you're interested in more, we have more studies than the ones I discussed. Um, we, this is our website, and we've been funded for, um, through um, LTR, NCs, and Sysync, and now SDIV. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Megan. That was really interesting. There's so many questions that I can think of, and I'm not an ecologist, so I want to throw it open to the audience. Um, if you have a question, um, let us know, and uh, you can unmute and ask. There's always a little bit of a time lag, right? So I'm going to throw one in while other people are thinking. Um, so there's a lot of uh, variables in all these um, analyses that you did. Um, I'm curious which of them most surprised you versus what you might have expected to see. Um, That's a great question. I am very surprised that global change manipulation type does not matter like adding carbon versus adding nitrogen versus a drought all just changes the community and it's just changing i found that surprising um i'm also surprised that there's no order progression to community change like if someone was to say like place your bets i would have bet a lot of money that even this changes first and that species are gains and lost at later time steps so those were very surprising so i'll let someone else take over in a moment but does this sort of upend some things that you might consider to be conventional wisdom then I think the the change in progression it does upend a little bit um, conventional wisdom and but I would say that would be it. I think a lot of like what's nice about this is we synthesize at a larger level what's happening, but a lot of individual experiments have found different components of this, and maybe now we can like see a bigger picture through the you know through all the detail. Great. So Matt Baker's posted that he has some questions. We'll let him go ahead, but I want to emphasize to students. We like to get questions from students, so try and think of some. Go ahead, Matt. Hi, Megan. Um, as I said, I have several questions, but one follow-up question to the statement you just made about the rank order of um, the progression was uh, whether the detection of that might be affected by um, the, the sampling frequency used for the experiments and uh, whether, I, mean, I, I didn't get a sense and maybe you said this, but how, whether that was a uh, variable across the different experiments and it, I, I would imagine it is. And so um, it, it could be uh, just spitballing that um, that kind of temporal um, uh, resampling re-inventory might influence your ability to detect the progression. Is that possible? That's a great point. And it certainly is possible. Most of our data sets sample on a yearly basis and we have then some variation in there. I'd be surprised if our pattern went away, but it's something I haven't looked into. And I think maybe we should. I think it's a really good point. I think there's so few studies that sample not yearly that I'd be surprised if they were skewing everything, but it could be, and it's certainly something I should look into. And make a note of that. Okay. I, I guess the original question I was going to start with, and maybe I'll just ask this one more and then uh, seed is, um, you said in your conclusions that you found that multi-factor treatments had larger effects than some of the other ones. And, and that brought me up, up. I wasn't sure that I saw that up until that you, you made that statement. And I guess what I thought I saw, and maybe you can correct me if I'm misinterpreting it, but it, I thought I saw that when you had like multiple nutrients, you tended to see larger effects. But if you, if you combined say a nutrient shift or an experiment with some other kind of global change shift, that sometimes those effect sizes were mitigated. And I'm wondering if um, you can clarify for me so I can integrate it more effectively. Yeah, so what we found is I can um, quickly scroll here. So here, maybe you're talking about this slide. What we find is like multiple resources, it's not just multiple nutrients. Like here, when we go, I don't have a good slide, but like when I look at the individual global change driver treatments alone, I only did that when we had at least five sites do the exact same manipulation. And so it really limited the number of global change treatments alone we could investigate. Um, and multiple nutrients do have a bigger effect than nitrogen alone or phosphorus alone, but we couldn't really get at like, you know, nitrogen and carbon dioxide and nitrogen and precipitation because we don't have that replicated enough overall. So to get around that, we just bin things into these categories. And so here it's multiple resources together, and this could be nitrogen, 
It could be multiple nutrients and water. It could be nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon dioxide. You know, who knows? That's a broad category. And so we, here we're just binning into multiple resources. And when we see this depression, it's resources co-occurring with non-resources. And most of our non-resources are things that are removed biomass. So a lot of our resources are, um, a lot of our treatments are resource additions. Resource additions make plants generally grow bigger and that has a bigger, more greater effects. And when you have a non-resource like burning or herbivory that takes away biomass, the effects of these treatments goes down a little bit. And this is, you know, I found this in this paper that's currently submitted and Kim in her paper in PNAS here generally finds the same thing. Like here's three resources together. Here's a resource by a non-resource. Here's resource alone. Thank you. That's very clarifying. Appreciate it. Okay. So we have a question here from Fred Hamrick. Fred, you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Thank you. First off, I was say, I've worked on the kinds of prairie, and I appreciate your comments about it because it, it does grow on you, except for the chiggers. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, my question about the is about the kinds of your work on the kinds of prairie. In my experience, there, the fraction coverage of C three and C four plants vary seasonally, and so, so do you take that into account in your analysis? Yeah, so what I'm just showing there is the maximum abundance through time. So we measure the plant communities twice. We measure them early in, you know, May, early June, and then later August. And that's because we know that the, you know, the C4 grasses have a peak of biomass early in the growing season where it's colder, and then they'll have maybe another peak in biomass in October, but we can't afford to go to Ponza three times. Um, and we're showing the maximum of those two time periods. So yeah, our measures should take that into account. And the C4 grasses are just overall so much more dominant than these C3 grasses. Okay, thank you. All right, so before we go to the next faculty question from Alan uh, Yankley, I just want to remind students, I don't see any student questions yet. So let's hope some come along, but Alan, you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, thanks, Megan. It's a great talk. And you really you, you exposed some things about rank abundance curves that I hadn't been thinking about and, um, at all. And I'm, I'd like to try the codine uh, data set uh, or on a data set that I have that I don't have a control. It's a long term treatment effect of controlled flooding on an urban wetland plant communities over 14 years. And so we've been plotting the rank abundance curves and trying to make sense of them. But without a control, is it still would it still be uh, meaningful to use the, the approach? Yeah, I absolutely think so. You could say, I mean, one way is to compare a control and a treatment. But you could say, you know, initially, what was changing most about the community was initially like lots of species being gained because there was a big change, and then species gain rates of gain trail off. You could look at any of these just through time, and so I think it still would be interesting to look at. And I'm not just biased because I think everyone should use this. <laughs> We have a, a case where a dominant um, invasive plant, reed canary grass, was replaced by a dominant native grass. So the rank abundance curve really doesn't change much, but like you were saying, the species shift was really strong. Um, so yeah, I'm really intrigued and ready to ready to go when I have some time to use your, your program. Great. Well, if you have any questions, you can always email. Okay, we have a question from Matt Fagan. All right, come on, students. All right, hi, great talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, I would say that this is just a mind-boggling amount of information to synthesize, and I think you're approaching it in a really novel way. It's so simple, yet it's so, it seems so obvious when I read your abstract, and I was like, oh, you found a new way to quantify these changes and made an R package out of it. This is cool. And I was wondering if there's a way to sort of integrate community-level analysis with this sort of broad analysis of the uh, Kind of the rank abundance curves, and I was thinking, like, are initially rare species more likely to be lost or change rank abundance in comparison to initially common species? So it's a great question. Yeah, and so movement. Yeah, for every analysis we've done, um, we've done another analysis where we do the same thing, just removing the rare species to see if it changes the patterns and it has no effect on the patterns we observe. So, I don't think what we're observing is being driven by rare species. It'd be really interesting to just see that as a portional percentage and then compare species which have a really long tail or compare communities with a really long tail to ones that are tail. I mean it's it kind of harks back to you know throughout all the rare species and you don't really see a functional change sort of ideas. 
And I'd really, I'd be interested to see the tropical version of this. And I, I think, you know, the herbaceous focus may make it tough, but because you're, a lot of the herbaceous communities, but there are lots of savannas in the world that could do some sort of analysis. Um, because I'm wondering if the, the the resilience would be different in a hyper diverse community. Um, yeah, I think that's a great point. So we are currently, um, I'm a professor now, I have a postdoc working with me and we're doing a big um, upgrade of the database. We're in the process of adding another 30 to 40 experiments. And so we wanted, we tried to get better coverage around the world, but it's hard to get, it's just, there's, it's hard to get people experiments where people track individual species through time beyond just richness in certain areas of the world, and there's just less money to do it. So I think we get a little better coverage, but it's still not great. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. So we have a well, question cool from there. Dennis Wiggum. I'm going to ask him to unmute and ask it himself in just a moment, but I just want to mention to people, um, Megan is able to stick around for a little while. If people want to say in chat after we uh, finish at 1 o'clock, um, we have a few a few people said they want to, but anybody who wants to stay in, we'll just we'll stop the recording and we'll just leave this open. But Dennis, you want to go ahead and Ask that question. Yeah. Uh, hi, Megan. Uh, uh, I see in the literature a lot of folks are interested these days in in using plant traits to try to assess ecosystem level processes, and many of the results I'm seeing so far indicate that it, it it's you know it doesn't always work very well. And uh, so I'm wondering if you have any any thoughts on you know that approach to looking at ecosystem responses versus the more species focused approach that uh, you folks have been using. Yeah, so that's a, so we're just funded to look at traits. Um, and I'm going to be real honest with you, I don't think traits are the end all be all. Like I know so like, yeah. there are these papers that are literally titled as like the holy grail, we finally solved it. And I think part of the problem is, you know, a species is a conglomerate of a lot of traits. And how do you really boil it down to what's most important. I don't think we really have a handle on that yet. Most of the traits we measure are things that are really easy to measure. So like SLA, it's fairly easy. So we have it for a ton of species. Below ground traits are really rare because they're extremely difficult to get. And so we don't have a lot of data on that. And so I think there's a lot of power in traits and I'm really excited, you know, in three weeks, I have this remote working group. I'm going to dive into the trait data and I'm excited to see what we can find. But I think there's just some limitations methodologically right now into really understanding and studying traits to get predictions of how communities are changing. And so I think there's something about a, a species that takes into account all of that that I, I still think is really important to species level analyses. Yes, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about that. Um, but I, I don't want to say traits are meaningless. I think, I mean, clearly I'm trying to pursue it. I think there's stuff to be found there, but I just don't think it's going to, it's not going to be a silver bullet. It's part of the tool pack of trying to understand things. Yeah, you get the impression that traits, like many other things, are are useful, and you can learn a lot from looking at them for, for some processes and patterns. But as you keep scaling up to larger and larger components of ecosystems, that's where it seems to not not have a lot of collective tightness. But maybe uh, your holy grail will work out, and once people figure out what it is you really need to look at, it'll be great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, we are at, at one o'clock. We're at one o one, actually. Megan, if you can unshare the screen, that's great. I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, but if anybody.